PLC stands for Programmable Logic Controller. Namely, it's a small computer that we can set up to interact with and automatically control other pieces of equipment. Because of their flexibility, PLCs are at the heart of nearly all industrial control systems and are also indispensable to everyday applications like elevators, traffic lights, and building HVAC. PLCs might seem complex at first glance, and they are, but they actually have the ideal learning curve. The basics are beginner friendly, and the ceiling of expertise is very high. Whether you're getting into controls and automation engineering, or just want to learn more about how industrial systems work, taking the time to understand PLC usage is well worth it. In this video, we'll explain the basics of everything PLC, what they are, how they work, and why we use them. To help create a fuller picture, we'll talk about both hardware and software aspects. Let's start off talking about the device hardware. If you open up a control cabinet, the PLC will probably be the single device with the most wires coming out of it. It can be hard to tell what's happening, but really most of the PLC ports are just switches used for turning different things on and off. These switches are the PLC outputs. We also have PLC inputs, which help determine when the output should operate. You might notice that some PLC blocks have repeating modules. These are likely expansion cards that give the PLC more inputs and outputs. There will also usually be some networking port, serial or ethernet, so that it can communicate with other devices. Device communication, although not necessary, is extremely helpful. Most PLCs are headless, meaning that they have no display. Networking allows for communication to other control equipment like HMI screens and computers, which can be used for initial configuration, live system monitoring, and sending digital inputs so that the user has a way to manually intervene in operations. So it's actually pretty simple if we break it down like this. There's a basic power port, a communication port, input ports, and output ports. When it's powered on, the PLC is always monitoring its inputs and adjusting the outputs accordingly then communicating with other devices to update its status. So what can a PLC take as an input? The inputs can be anything that can send or convey an electric signal. A signal could be from a button being pressed, a proximity sensor being approached, or a limit switch actuating, just same of you. Because PLCs have networking capabilities, they can even take digital data from other devices as inputs through the communication port. This is what makes PLCs useful in such a wide array of applications. They can process virtually any type of data from an environment via sensor and then act on that information to make decisions. The decisions that the PLC makes are whether to open or close each output device, which is typically a solid state switch or a relay. The solid state switch can only conduct either DC or AC, but not both. For these switches, BJTs are used for DC and triacs are used for AC. Relays can conduct both DC and AC as well as handle more current, but their response time is roughly 10 milliseconds, far slower than that of solid state switches. In operations where the PLC outputs aren't able to support a necessary load, they can be cascaded with a secondary properly sized relay, enabling the PLC to control any size or type equipment. Typically, inputs and outputs are digital. This means that they're interpreted in binary states, on or off, present or not present, open or closed. However, most PLCs will have specialized ports or expansions that allow for analog signal processing. This can be necessary for reading voltage ranges for measurements like temperature, and then outputting a corresponding range of small currents, which further opens the door to precise levels of control. Again, the inputs are used to make decisions about the outputs, and this is accomplished through control logic. Even if you have no experience with this subject, you likely have a good intuition about the basics. Imagine I like to control the power to a motor. The easiest way to do this is by using a single contactor, such that the motor status is directly tied to the contactor state. This is useful, but we might want to add a safety switch upstream in series that we can lock out in case we need to do maintenance. Now, we need both the safety switch and the contactor on at the same time to power the motor. This is called an AND gate. If we want to control power to the contactor from a second button in a different location, it can be wired in parallel such that the contactor, and thus the motor, will turn on when either button 1 or button 2 is pressed. This is called an OR gate. There are several more basic building blocks like this that, when you use them in conjunction, can scale up to form very complicated networks to accomplish very complicated tasks, like generator power transfers or mechanical recloser operation. While this is all feasible with physical relays and switches, and yes, this is how things used to be done, it might end up requiring so many relays and wires that things quickly get out of hand, making management, maintenance, and troubleshooting a real nightmare. Thankfully, the advent of PLCs eliminated all of this headache. Instead of using hardware logic through components, the same control schemes can be implemented digitally in PLC software. This saves on space, helps with troubleshooting, makes modifying the circuit significantly easier, and overall lets us accomplish much more with much less. For industrial systems, PLCs are the de facto bridge between control software and physical actuation. 
There are five different PLC programming languages as standardized by IEC 61131-3. These are ladder logic, function block diagram, structured text, sequential function chart, and instruction list. The first three are the most common, supported by nearly all PLCs, so we'll talk about them a little more. Ladder logic and function block diagram are what are known as graphical languages, which means they try to make programming as intuitive and straightforward as possible, even to someone with no coding experience. Ladder logic is device oriented and frames everything in terms of contacts and coils, inputs and outputs. Like the name suggests, each line of logic is a rung on the ladder, and every rung is evaluated one by one from top to bottom. Function block diagrams are more oriented around digital logic representation. While it still has the same line organization of ladder logic, FBD uses black box operators or function blocks with defined inputs and outputs to achieve the same outcome. Lastly, we have structured text, which is more akin to traditional high-level programming like Python or C++. It's significantly more customizable and compact, but it has a steeper learning curve and is easier to make mistakes in complex implementations. Here are three very simple equivalent programs written in each language. Feel free to pause the video to try to work out what the outputs Q1, 2, and 3 are in response to any combination of the inputs I1, 2, and 3. Ladder logic, function block diagrams, and structured text can incorporate digital markers, implement control loops, make use of timers, and much more. They're all well suited for pretty much any industrial process, no matter how complex. Programs can range from several lines to several thousands of lines and are stored locally on the PLC itself ensuring operation even in case of an external network outage. It can be tough to learn the ins and outs of these programming languages, just as it would any spoken language, but there are tons of great free online resources to help get you started. Now, with the background info out of the way, let's go over the basic workflow of implementing a PLC program from start to finish. First, you'll have to determine what specific PLC you're working with. This can be a matter of I.O. specifications, voltage ratings, or simply availability. This matters because each PLC will work with a different programming platform. Codasys is the most common, freely available platform, but there are plenty of other solid options that don't support Codasys. For beginners, learning the user interface of a new platform will probably be the most difficult part in this process, but it's just a matter of exposure and practice. Once that's determined, you'll download the platform and begin making your PLC program in one of the five languages mentioned before. Most platforms like Codasys and Eaton's EasySoft have built-in simulators, and these are really good tools for testing out logic before pushing it to a live system. After the program is ready, establish communication with the PLC through your PLC software over Ethernet or serial connection, and then upload and copy your tested program to the PLC. If you want to do live troubleshooting, you can monitor the inputs and outputs of the PLC as it's running through the same connection you uploaded the program from. Otherwise, you can disconnect and the PLC will be able to run on its own in conjunction with any other network control software and physical inputs. Although the details of every individual application will differ, these are the basic steps that are necessary for every implementation. In this video, we talked about PLCs. They're modular, easily expandable, and a core part of every industrial application today. Just this one piece of equipment opens the door to the entire field of controls and automation engineering. To learn more about PLCs and how they're used in the electrical power industry, contact us or your local Eaton representative to schedule a visit to one of Eaton's Power Systems Experience Centers today.